All right. Uh, as you can see, Sheila spends an enormous amount of fruitful energy in establishing high-quality joy relationships in a atmosphere in which many children come. Uh, the surrounding atmosphere is less than joy, and she's she's really a missionary of joy where she is, and to and to the rest of the school. But what if you could build a school from the ground up that, that was relationally based and joy-filled? You might do things like we do, and, and basically the entire school, K-12, to is no more than 208 students. Six, no more than 16 students in a class, no more than one class at each grade level. Why? Because beyond that, you start to become a crowd, not a community. Whoever thought it was a good idea to put 2,013-year-olds in the same place at the same time is certifiably mad. And yet, this kind of institutional thought that somehow we've got a factory model is really informing much of what goes on uh, in large-scale, state-led state uh, education. But what if you had as a priority that by October 1... Every student knew the name of every other student in the school. Not just in their class, that, that I'm a kindergarten, and at five years old, I walk in, and it's October, and I look around, and I recognize every face. And everybody knows my name. I've only been there for a month, so I don't know everybody else's name yet, but everybody who's been there for a while knows my name. How does that change what it's like to be five in that atmosphere? What happens if when you walked up, every teacher was outside and every teacher greeted you with a smile and a handshake or a slap on the back, something that said, good to be here with you. And they were out there with you in the day and you didn't have a teacher's lounge. Because nothing good happens in teachers' lounges. <laughs> and we actually want, and you ate every day you had lunch with your teacher. So your teacher sat on a table and you sat with them and you talked. You talked about what you'd been learning, you talked about what had been happening. And the teacher got actually to talk about good table manners in a joyful way. How would that change your experience of school? Uh, this British educator, Charlotte Mason, her, one of her six books was entitled School Education. And the three chapters that are the apex of that book are all entitled the same thing. Education, the science of relations, colon, we are educated by our intimacies. Now, what a different vision for education. That it's not primarily data download that can be mastered on a test. Like, I remember 10th grade literature, 10th grade English class, and we read, quote read, Great expectations. You remember Pip and Miss Habersham and Estella? Let me tell you how I went about it. Because remember my goal? Maximize grade, minimize effort. Somehow I, I actually thought that like getting the cliff notes was cheating, so I, I didn't do that. But I scanned every page of the book. I made sure I knew the primary characters, knew the basic plot line, and I zoomed in on a particular paragraph in case there was a question of Dickens' literary style so that I could then answer that. How well do you think I did on the test? A plus. But let me tell you a thought that never crossed my mind. It's not a thought that I would have necessarily been opposed to. It's just a thought that I had been in school for 11 years, and this thought never crossed my mind. That I could read Great Expectations, a work by a brilliant observer of human relationships, and I could have a mind-to-mind -mind meeting with the author, Dickens, 
and learn something about myself and something about the human condition. That's just not a thought that ever crossed my mind. Like I've been in school for 11 years. First 13 years in school, that thought never crossed my mind. What did you do? You scanned for data as efficiently as possible so that you'd sit down, take the test, and be one of the winners. Then get lots of praise and avoid shame. That's what you did. Let me tell you, uh, last year, a teacher's out front of the school, and uh, it's break time, and one of the five-year-olds, actually it was the principal, one of the five-year-olds, now this is to the school principal, six-year-old, six-year-old, first grader, six-year-old runs up and says, Mr. Smith, I've got a rock And Mr. Smith looks down, looks in the eyes of the student, gets a big smile, and says, look at that rock. Wow, do you see the various minerals? Look, I think that's quartz. This is so fascinating. Well, what happens? Soon we got four other boys all around looking at this rock. What happens after that? We have a geological excavation going on throughout the playground here. Everybody's digging for rocks. Everybody's, all the boys are bringing Mr. Smith rocks. Why? Well, if you've read uh, a lot of the Shepherd's House and Joy Starts Here material, you've heard of the terms of two-way bonding and two-way joy bonding and three-way bonding. Joy bonding. Let me suggest another thing that's very important for education. And I call it triangulated joy bonding. That's when you find something good in God's creation or some good creation of a human person and you look at it and you look at the other person and you share and you bond in joy over a good, true, and beautiful thing. And then everybody's joy level goes up and pretty soon... We got a dozen budding geologists. Mr. Smith gets rocks for the next three days, four days. One of the parents comes up to him and says, man, my son, we got so many rocks. My son made me go to Walmart last night to buy a rock polisher. Now Mr. Smith's getting polished rocks. (laughs) Right? Another story. Uh, Mr. Jones is the 11th grade history, is, is an 11th grade teacher, and he's teaching, he's a high school teacher teaching history. And uh, there's a two week block on the Civil War in which first week is spent uh, reading the events leading up to the, the progression of the war uh, and the conclusion of the war. Second week is spent focused in on Mr. Lincoln. Uh, Read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, read the Gettysburg Address, read, narrate, discuss Gettysburg Address, read, narrate, discuss the finest work of political discourse in the history of the human race, which is Lincoln's second inaugural address. If you want a vision for, if you want a political vision, read Lincoln's second inaugural address. Uh, Thursday, there's a group of guys in the class. They're 15, 16. They have a folk country rock band. On Thursday, they're supposed to go to the garage where the amps, the drums, the guitars are all stored to practice. They cancel practice. Instead, they go to Walmart. They buy two king size she- three king-size sheets, white sheets, and some black dye. They go to the garage, but instead of practicing, they sew together two of the white sheets. They dye the third. They put the black sheet on top of the white, and they cut out a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln. Why? Because they want their music to communicate to the audience the same principles that animated Mr. Lincoln. 
Now that's history. Not memorizing, scanning for dates and numbers that you can spit back on a Scantron test so that you can be a winner, not a loser. That's joy together over inspirational ideas and the ideas of a person who had a profound impact on American history and what it means to do community together. So that's pretty good. Two weeks later, they actually get a gig at a little Texas honky-tonk. And uh, so Mary Ellen and I go to see them. And place is packed out. And sure enough, there's Mr. Lincoln behind the drums, behind the amps. Woman next to me says, is that Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> yes. Why is he there? Go talk to the band. Now you think that's pretty good. But it gets better. A couple of weeks later, the guys are standing around and they say, you know, there are elderly people in this town who can't get out to hear good live music. And they would enjoy good live music, thinking of themselves, of course, because they are 16 and haven't totally overcome their narcissism. But uh, we should do something about that. So they call the four, nar- four nursing homes in town. This is totally on their own. There's no, this is no youth minister project. This is the band. They call four nursing homes, say, we'd like to give a free concert for your residents. Two of the nursing homes say, great. Two of them say, no, thank you. I don't know what those two are thinking. Not very high joy people, I would suggest. So a couple weeks later, on a Friday night, there they are. Setting up Mr. Lincoln, setting up the drum, setting up the amps, and pushing wheelchairs through the hall to help bring their audience to play. They do their first set of their music, and a hand goes up. Do you know any oldies? (laughs) They weren't insulted. They just talked together. What can we figure out that they might know and enjoy? How does that happen? I mean, most 16-year-olds, you probably know, would not be caught dead in a nursing home. They wouldn't have no idea how to have a multi-generational relationship. They'd be absolutely clueless. They might feel guilty about the fact that they don't know how to do it, but one thing's sure, they'd know they don't know how to do that. Well, if you have your 8th graders partnered with your 3rd graders, and your 7th graders partnered with your 4th graders, and your 6th with your 5th, And twice a month at 2 o'clock, you you load up on the bus and you go to a nursing home and everybody's got a friend. And the older ones teach the younger ones how to interact, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And then the adults are there to kind of brief everybody on how you conduct yourself here and that you might see something. And if you walk into an uncomfortable situation, what do you do? Because the bigger brains have to inform the little brains on this. So then you have children that for five years, six years, they've been going to nursing homes. These are, these are part of their people. These are not odd, and it's the most natural thing in the world. Now, notice what's come together here. Caring for the elderly, an appreciation of Mr. Lincoln, a love of music, all together. Well, that doesn't happen by accident. That happens because the leaders of the community have been very intentional in what they're doing and in what the community values. They have joy amplified the right things. I mean, I remember being a senior in high school, played high school football, uh, enjoyed it, but was struck by this oddity. When we played the Crosstown Rival, at 12.30, most of the rest of the afternoon was canceled, and we'd all go out on the field, and we'd parade the football players, and we'd cheer, and we'd introduce the seniors, and the whole stadium would be filled, and that would be a day's event, because that's what this particular tribe celebrated, said was worthy, said who the winners were, and losers were. And uh, a 
couple of weeks later, there's an announcement over the PA system. The math club has won the state championship in the math competition. Now, that even as a high school senior taught me it as kind of a non sequitur. How is it like we're supposed to be this educational entity and we're playing the cross-time rival in football and we get half-day celebration, uh, math team wins the state championship, and you get an announcement over the PA system? What does it happen? Now, and of course, the other thing that comes to mind now, I didn't think this then, was what about the student that has been struggling for the last six months to solve a quadratic equation? And finally, the light's gone off, and he now gets it. And he understands how you solve quadratic equations. And nobody's celebrating him. Nobody's joy bonding. We're just saying, well, we're glad you get it. You're not as much a loser as you used to be. But what if you had a class where we were all in it together, and everybody knew your name, and most of these people I've been with, I'm now in the seventh grade, and we've been together for six years, and we've been growing, and boy, we know everybody's weakness. We know everybody's strength. We know everybody's story, and we're glad to be together. And uh, as one graduating senior told me, she said, I look around at my classmates, and I say this to myself. She said, had I been anywhere else, none of these people would be my friend. Because she said, I was a cheerleader before I translated, and I was in the, quote, cheerleader group, and I didn't have anything to do with, no offense, these kind of people. But she said, They're my br- these guys are my brothers. And I've been given a great gift. What if you had a school in which there was zero tolerance for social hierarchy? Because there was no social hierarchy. Because we're all in it together. And when a predator comes in and tries to establish a social hierarchy, there's a firm but gentle dealing with weakness. Here's a quote from Charlotte Mason. What we are concerned with is the fact that we personally have relations with all there is in the present, all there has been in the past, all that there will be in the future, with all above us and all about us, and that fullness of living Expansion, expression, and serviceableness for each of us depends upon how far we apprehend these relationships and how many of them we laid hold of. What is it like to have a multitude of relationships with art? True story. A uh, six-year-old, first graders, Visiting the McNay Gallery in San Antonio. The McNay is the finest art gallery in San Antonio. Sixth grader walks into a room, says, Mom, it's a Monet! The docent's jaw drops. Because sure enough, it's a Claude Monet. And it's the only one in the room. It's the only one the, the gallery has. This six-year-old has never seen it, but he walks in the room. You see, Claude Monet was a friend of his. See, he had spent four months. That was their artist uh, at our schools. Every year we do two great masters, two great composers, two great poets. And the idea is that you would know something of the life of the master, something of the life of the poet, Uh, You would have a relationship with them. You would study their work. You would study their, in this case, art. So he had studied a half dozen of Monet's paintings. He'd learned a little bit about his life. He had done a couple of reproductions in as close to Claude Monet's style as he could. So at six, when he walks into the gallery, he recognizes the work of his friend. You see, he had an intimacy with the art. 
It wasn't a matter of mere data collection for a test. Oh, by the way, we, we don't have tests because all tests do is divide the strong and the weak and create a competitive, hostile environment. Well, you do have regular assessments. In fact, everything you do, everything you say is, helps the teacher. And for us, what assessments are is we're just trying to be clear about where you're strong and where you're weak so that we can be a good protector and help you where you're weak. We have no interest in ranking you and comparing you with your classmates. We have every interest in clearly, and, and one of the problems about the ranking, identifying, testing, is you actually can hide weakness pretty well. I mean, like if you become proficient in a very narrow skill set, that skill set being stan scanning data and putting it in a short-term memory, you can become very proficient and remain very weak in many areas. We, we actually want weakness to show up so that the teacher as a strong protector can come alongside and help. And help. And so then, uh, we do have exam weeks. We do exams at the end twice a year. And they love it, like children love exams. They can't wait. Why? Because we've not associated performance anxiety with it. So, for exam week, it looks something like this. You, you come for half a day, and uh, you have a couple of questions given you, and you're, we, we actually want you to tell, you what you, tell us what you know rather than try to trick you and figure out what you don't know. And the children, they actually are excited about exam week. Because this is the time we get to tell back. And that's how the teachers frame it. I mean, no student knows exams are bad or scary things unless the adults tell them. Like, for most of us, exam, kind of the stomach goes to knots. There's only one reason for that. That's because the bigger brains we've been associated with have told us that that's a scary, potentially dangerous, bad thing. If the bigger brains don't tell you that, you never get that idea. So you walk into your, like this would be a typical American history final exam. The 20th century was called the American century by Times journalist Henry Luce. Discuss the rise of American influence, global influence, in terms of its, America's domestic policy and growth and its international policy growth. Do this by identifying every president from the Hoover administration on and talking about the primary domestic and international issues which each administration faced. Great, go. And they sit there and they write for the next two hours. And there's no shame and no guilt and everybody just tells what they know. It's actually fun. What a concept that sitting down and writing what you know could be an enjoyable experience together. Well, that all hinges on what the bigger brains have said to us, what kind of relationship they've established. Can't tell you the number of students have showed up and uh, parents have showed up and they say, well, you know, uh, I was not a math person. My mother was not a math person. My father's not a math person. Uh, my husband's not a math person. Ergo, our son is not going to be a math person. You can do pretty good in literature and soccer, but math. And all we can do is say, please, 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 don't communicate that. Because <laughs> you don't know. You don't know. And in fact, God has made our minds in such a way as that we're made to know and to flourish when we understand his language, by studying his language, the language of creation, by studying great works of art, great works of music, by actually sitting at the feet of Charles Dickens and learning something of the, my own nature and the nature of human persons. 
I mean, it was uh, every, at vet, around Veterans Day, the, our, the nearest chapel prior to Veterans Day, we, we, do a, we honor the veterans. And the student, we invite veterans from the community to come. We have them speak. Certain ones speak. Uh, we sing some songs. And, and the children get to express their appreciation. This particular time, we had a uh, student... We had a, a, one of the vets was a Vietnam vet, and let's just say he was pretty low joy. We have this World War II general who's pretty high joy, then we have this Vietnam vet who was, just in this case, pretty low joy, and he talked about his problems with addiction and how the government mistreated him and yada, yada, yada. And now we've got the whole school. And we don't, like, vet there. We, you don't ask a, an Air Force general to give you his talk so you can read it before before he talks, so we don't, and so we have this talk, and as they're leaving, one of the teachers, fifth grade teacher says, I've got some cleanup to do, gets to the classroom, they sit down, and a couple of students raise their hand, they said, you know that man who talked from the Vietnam soldier, he was very sad, and another one says, yeah, he remind you remember in the story, The Yearling, when Joey was standing by, Joey's dad took him to the graveyard and there was buried Joey's sibling, older sibling. And, and th- his dad says this. His dad says, Joey, the reason your mom is cold and distant from you is because she lost all these babies before you, and so she's afraid of being close to you. And this student says, I think that's what's going on with this guy. I think he's been very hurt. The teacher came back and told us, why did I think I had to say anything? Right? Oh, incidentally, one of our core principles is that the Holy Spirit's the one true teacher. That, and not just on spiritual principles, in everything. In everything. Mathematics, who's the prime teacher? The Holy Spirit. Literature, who's the prime teacher? The Holy Spirit. Art, music, science, who's the prime teacher? The Holy Spirit. Now, I could spend a whole hour unpacking that, but I think it's time for us to have a break. 